sort of work, you know, preaching um, in universities connected with um, the Mahabharata Youth Clubs. And it was a kind of pillar of our work in order to encourage new devotees to join the temple. 1983, we were very lucky to have Sadat Bhutta, who was given the position of the Cavendish Laboratory with uh, uh, Brian Josephson, who was a Nobel laureate. Um, and I got to hang out with Sadat Bhutta a bit at that time. Later on with Rasaraj, who has a lot of interest in physics and quantum uh, theory. And then um, I was lucky to work with Sadabut again on the Mayapur project. So I have no scientific background myself. I studied architecture. <laughs> but uh, it is a bit of an interest. And in recent years, I've been really kind of burning on the fact that our preaching is so developed here in Britain. We're doing so many incredible things. But we are woefully behind in this aspect of what Prabhupada wants, that we learn how to present Krishna consciousness to the scientific community and we really make some very, very serious challenges to the physicalist and materialist philosophies which are being used to describe what is life, what is existence. So, the Atman paradigm is a way of actually analyzing scientific data with the insights of Bhagavatam, Upanishads, and Vedanta, and trying to formulate a presentation that can be taken to actually the public. And it's slightly different to some of the ways that um, we have worked within ISKCON in relationship to science. I am taking the approach that we are not challenging or disputing any scientific data or evidence. We are not challenging the evidence. We don't need to. Actually, all the evidence points to the Krishna conscious conclusion. What we challenge is the philosophical interpretation that is given in the name of science to that evidence, and which is very clearly a rather silly stupid interpretation of very clear data. The same uh, problem we used to talk about with the impersonalists. You know? Actually, the statements of Shastra are clear, but the impersonalists twist it around. Word jugglery. You know, they just kind of create a different meaning when the meaning is absolutely clear. Actually, scientific data is really clear, and that's what I will be showing you in some of these presentations. The data is simple, and anyone can understand it. And actually, we can build up our whole Krishna conscious argument of that we are not this body, that consciousness belongs to a different reality than physical matter. We can present it all the way up to how the universe appears, how the species appear, how we can explain every <coughs> aspect of existence within the material world purely from scientific data, without quoting Shastra. So that's what I'm going to give you a flavor of. This is purely an introduction to the, the, what we call the Atman Paradigm. Working with a number of very useful, key, very intelligent devotees, we've been able to devise this into kind of a huge study. But I've only got an hour with you this morning. So I'm just going to try and give you a flavor of what it's all about. In very simple terms, these are the big questions, the big issues of life. Consciousness. Matter. Life. The universe. These are the big questions which everyone, whether you're involved in science, whether you're involved in religion, whether you're involved in philosophy, these are the ones we want to study. Science makes a reasonable attempt, and this is the kind of boundary that science is able to do. When we talk about science, we're talking about a method, a process of establishing theories as being validated. Please, go find this again. Um, it's a process. Science isn't, we, sometimes we say, science says. No, science doesn't say anything. There is a scientific process by which we can come to a sort of consensus about what we believe to be true as a scientific theory. But it is limited. It can 
give us certain insights into each of these subjects, but it always comes up against a boundary. And when it comes up to that boundary, it starts to invoke philosophy. As soon as science mentions anything to do with chance or randomness, it is strayed beyond the scientific process, beyond what can be tested, what can be proved, into something which is theoretical. And the problem with those theories that involve chance and randomness is there is no ability to interact with chance or randomness through the scientific process. If something is non-causal, if something doesn't have a cause, how can you investigate it according to cause and effect? Right? So you're immediately coming up with a theory, oh, that, um, for instance, physical matter pops out of nothingness, which again is a philosophical concept, by chance. That is not a scientific theory. It's a philosophical one. And our problem is that there's these stupid philosophical theories which don't even comply with the rules of philosophy. And what we're saying is you've got good evidence, but you have to apply good philosophy to it. And that is what we're suggesting, is that the scientific model cannot encompass all the issues, all the phenomena that we understand in terms of consciousness, life and matter and the universe. We need a bigger box to put all of this in. And it's going to have to be a philosophical box, because the scientific box will never ever be big enough. It needs help. Science needs help from good philosophy. And that's what we're trying to offer in, through the Atman Paradigm. A philosophical model. But a philosophical model which is science consistent. And by that I mean that it is the, the ideas and philosophy that we have is absolutely consistent with scientific data. It is not battle. It is not in contradiction. So let us just explore one aspect of this today, the most important one, consciousness. And consciousness can be defined as that annoying time between naps. <laughs> I mean, it's something which disturbs you when you are awake. Alright? So consciousness, what is it? We start with this question. Do you exist? Please ask yourself that question. Do you exist? Not to run it, uh, anyone in disagreement? <laughs> it's something we take for granted. But actually it's a very, very big question. And perhaps more difficult than do you exist is how do you know you exist? How do you know you exist? Self-evident. Uh, that's not an answer. It is an answer. But well, tell me what you mean by self-evident, then. At, at least to the first person, our own existence is... Uh, well, give me verbalise it a little bit, what your experience is that leads you to, make, to assume that it's self-evident. I'm not disagreeing that you're right, I just want more. Um, well, I think this Descartes' argument. Well, I'm going to uh, Descartes, which, which you'll come to, I'm sure. Well, we, we, it's pretty well, it's hard to dispute the fact that we exist, since, for one thing, we're asking a question. Um, unless we existed, we won't be able to ask the question. That's right. <laughs> other people recognize that I exist. I'm existing in other people's existence. At least we, we believe we are. Yeah. 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 The point is, we know I'm here. I feel I'm here. I feel I'm experiencing something here and now. Well, surely that means I must exist. It's as simple as that, isn't it? I kind of feel I'm here. But how do we know what we're so-called experiencing is actually real? All we can say is that, for me, I am currently experiencing this. And Descartes asked himself, well, what can I know for certain? What can I know, know is real? And his meditation or contemplation was that everything that uh, I learn from my senses could be flawed. For instance, I see something at a distance, it could be nearby, I don't know the distance. I put a stick in water and it appears bent. But it's not bent. So I can't trust 
the information I get from my senses. I hear something in the background and thought it was that, but it was something else. My senses can't be trusted. My, my, my thoughts, my memories, I can't rely on any of them. So what can I actually know for certain? And his point was, the only thing that I can know for certain is that I am the person having those thoughts. The thoughts themselves may be wrong, may be delusional, <laughs> may be mistaken, may be silly, but I am the person having the thoughts. So his kind of conclusion was, I know I exist as a thinking person. And that's my existence, as a conscious, aware, thinking person. I, we could, you know, you get into a very big debate, but I want to take you along a little further. So this gives us a way in to what we mean by consciousness. The conviction that we exist. Right? And any philosophy that deals with consciousness better acknowledge and explain and collaborate that we have a conviction that we exist. Now believe it or not, most theories of, in neuroscience do not do that. They will deny that you exist. But we'll come to that a little bit later. And a good theory of consciousness is going to have to, again, collaborate that you are the I, the self. And the same self throughout our life. The body is changing. Our personality is changing. Our attitudes are changing. Everything that we, that we think about is changing. But we as the same thinking person remain. I am the same person who experienced life as a child, as a youth, as an adult, to my old age. Right? The I does not change. The I who is experiencing life remains the same. So you better have a good theory. Do you want to kind of pull up another? I don't want to sit so bad. No, 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 yeah, I want to put it back for you. Just. Uh, maybe just uh, yeah. right there. So that has to be included in any good description of consciousness. And that you experience things in your mind called qualia. Qualia. This is the most important word you're going to hear today. Apart from all the things about Krishna. <laughs> but apart from that, this is the most important word. Hands up who knows who's heard this word before. Just come across it. Well done. It is really, really important. It is the key to your preaching. And I'm going to take you through that in detail. Qualia. What is it? It's a Latin word. It's plural. And it means all the things that we experience in our mind. Now we think we're experiencing the outside world. But actually all we ever experience is what is fed to us within the mind. That takes a lot of unpicking. In fact, we are so absorbed into the idea that we're this body, we haven't a clue that we're not experiencing the outside world directly. We are so conditioned. And even as devotees, we still don't understand the process that is going on. So this is what we're going to try and unpick today, because it really does hold the key to presenting that consciousness cannot be a product of the brain, and that consciousness must be the feature of some different form of reality. So what do we mean by the things that we experience in our minds? There are different types. The most common that are talked about are sense experiences. And you recognize that this is obviously a big topic. When the Bible talks about experiencing life in the different senses, these come up again. You know, the sense experiences related to vision, related to hearing, relating to touch, to smell and to taste. Now, we think that what we're experiencing are the directly what is outside, in the outside world, and not within our mind. We'll go through this in a couple of different ways, and it starts to kind of sink in. But we'll look first at what we think we know by seeing. Remember this one that kind of almost broke the internet. All right, what color is the dress? What color? 
gold, gold and white. Gold and white. Mm. What colour is the dress? Blue and black. It's blue and black. So these two colors. Hands up the blue and black side. Hands up the gold, actually, and the, the gold and white, that's me. Well, and then, blue and ah, that's actually blue quite, and a, quite a great hand. Huh? Blue and gold. gold. Light brown gold. gold. So we're actually seeing different colors. The same, you're both looking at the same picture, the same physical thing on the screen, but you're seeing different colors. So where is color? Is color on the outside world or is color in your mind? You see? We are, we, we're trained in school to think, well, color is all to do with the electromagnetic spectrum, isn't it? It's wavelength. Color is wavelength. You know, if, if, you know uh, when light has a wavelength of this, it's red. It's red out there. If it has that wavelength, it, that wavelength, that light must be blue. Light does not have any color. And Newton was the first one to point out that the deficiencies of the wavelength thing. Because he said, all right, there's all those colors. Where's this color? Magenta. Where's that? What, what wavelength is that? There is no wavelength relating to magenta. But it's a color that you see in your mind. So somehow or other, the mind is producing that color for you to experience. But it is not a color in the outside world. Actually, you can take the uh, spectrum and they put it around <coughs> the outside here. And, you know, therefore you can kind of see there's the reds and the white, greens and the round. But actually, all the colors in the middle are produced in your mind. When you look at a television, how many colors does a television screen? They say, oh, what they say, this has got a million colors now, don't they? You know, you buy a new uh, LED plasma, whatever you've got, it's got a million colors. How many colors does a TV screen have? Three. There's only three colors there. But you're seeing a million colors. Those colors do not exist out there. Actually, they don't even exist there. There's just three different inputs. But your mind is mixing all those up and producing colors for you to experience. And how that happens in the brain is a complete mystery for neuroscience. Color is one of the biggest mysteries. Yeah, here's another little kind of play around, just to show that what you see isn't what's there. There's two squares, A and B. Now, we're looking, are they the same color of grey? Because grey also, where's that in the spectrum? So, are they the same color? Are they They're the same color, exactly. But you didn't see that. Your mind is not showing you in reality. It's actually interpreting stuff for you. And everything you experience is an interpretation of the inputs that you get. Here's another nice example. It's called, um, was it a redoxic um, picture? Where you can see greens, actually this is, you know, it's not projecting very well, but there's blues and other colors in there. But actually it's made up entirely of reds and black. But you see different colors. So basically what the brain has is data. It's like one of these paint by numbers things, it's got data. Yes, it's getting inputs and the input varies according to the wavelength um, that it's receiving. But basically the brain just takes that and interprets it as numbers. Is it one, two, three, four, five? What number is that color? And that's all the brain has. But something is happening that that data is being taken and interpreted and something is applying color to it. And that's what we experience. So that's just an analysis of visual things. We can do the same actually with all the other sense inputs as well. It is very, very interesting when you delve into what you experience and you know, what is the input. But it doesn't complete what are qualia. You have to include within qualia other sensations such as Fear, happiness, even hunger and thirst. These are all qualia. This is what you experience in your mind. Pain is one of the big qualia that 
completely misunderstood by neuroscience. Yeah, you think, oh, we understand pain because there's nerves firing away and you can give drugs as a particular suppressive. But why, when all that's happening in your mind is some neurons firing, why that turns into the experience of the qualia of, ow, oh, I felt something. Where does that qualia come from? And other types of qualia are thoughts, ideas, desires, plans, all the stuff that your mind is feeding you from morning to night, the constant conversation of it. So, this was all summarized by a very famous neuroscientist called David Chalmers, who said, and he coined this phrase, the hard problem. And he said, the hard problem is how physical processes in the brain give rise to the subjective experience of qualia. How do we know what's happening in the brain? And he, he said this 30, 40 years ago. But it is true today. In fact, just, um, there was a summary of consciousness by a new scientist um, for one of their magazines. And they did a whole big thing of it. And they started it like, by saying this. There are many hard problems in science. But only one problem gets to call itself the hard problem of science. And that is consciousness. You have to understand, at the beginning of the whole scientific process is the problem of consciousness. Which is a little weird when you think that actually the scientific process is I am trying to understand. I am trying to experience the world. I am trying to know. Those are all conscious steps. Science depends. It's built on the fact that I exist as a conscious being. And we can't explain it. So, this is the hard problem. And we're going to explore it using a little bit of gadgetry behind me here. So, what we have here is, uh, we're going to use the analogy related to electronics and computing. Which is actually really useful that we're living in this age. And it, these are very, very helpful analogies that we can use in preaching. Because although people are no longer following the meditational processes which help to distinguish between the Atma as the observer of the mind and the body, still they understand what's happening with their computers. So, useful analogy. And that's why I've set this up. We start with our senses. And here we have a little camera. The eye works almost exactly like a video camera. Basically, light goes in through the lens and is focused on a plate at the back. And the eye is the, uh, the retina and converted by the cones and the rods into electrical, a little electrical message. And that heads off down the wire from the back of the eye. And this little, in the eye, it's called the optic nerve. Optic nerve. Right? And that shoots off to the back of the brain, area 17, the visual processing area. And it might take a minute to warm up. There it goes. And what I have is here is a little probe which is attached to that optic nerve. So that's the message. That's the electrical input that is coming from that camera. And that's what the brain has. And that's all the brain has. It's just a little electrical pattern firing in the brain. Neurons connecting with one another, forming some kind of pattern related to that input. That's all the brain's got. And it's the same with... The, no, that's on very well. No, it's not the cell ball. Yeah. Anyway, you've got a microphone and an ear. And it does the same thing. It receives a bit of vibration in the air, moves the eardrum and the, the insides of the ear, sets up something which converts it all into an electrical message. 
So that goes down to another part of the brain, which we can pick up here. That's that one there. And in fact, we've got the two of them going together. So, basically, whatever our senses are doing, it's just turning it into an electrical message, sending that into the brain. We taste something. What's set up? A little electrical message goes to the brain. Another neural pattern. We smell something. Another electrical thing. So all we've got going on in the brain are these different electrical patterns. Is that what we experience? Is that how we experience existence? No. What we experience is imagery. When, when this message is sent into the brain there, we're not seeing some little electrical pattern and we're just not feeling a buzz. And, you know, we're actually getting a sound, a note, a tune, a melody. When we taste something, you know, we're not getting just, you know, oh, that's a nice electrical pattern in the brain. <laughs> you know, there's actually, wow, that's a really nice flavor. You know, that something was really nice. That's sweet, that's fantastic. So we experience qualia. And this is the big problem. That what we're experiencing doesn't tie up to what we know is in the brain. So the big question for neuroscience, and that's what David Chalmers was saying, the hard problem is, how do you get from this stuff here, just the electrical patterns, which is all the brain does, to the image that is in your mind? Or the flavor, or the smell, or the sound, or the sensation of touch that you experience. <coughs> and part of the thing is, we look at this by saying, well, actually, uh, just take you back a second to this. There must be some other process at work which is using that information within the brain, but is reading it, decoding it, and converting it into the qualia that you experience. Because that isn't the qualia on its own. There's something more at work. And what we're suggesting is that there's some form of interface, which is brain reading, analyzing that, decoding it, and turning it into something that is then projected very poorly with the power of this poor little projector into the imagery that is shown on the screen of consciousness. And this is exactly the phrasing that is used by neuroscientists. That's the interesting part. They talk about it like this. That there is some kind of process which is ultimately presenting that on the screen of consciousness for us to be aware. And the very simple question in terms of um, computing is, why is there a screen? Why does a computer have a screen? Does a computer need the screen in order to do all the processing that it's working on? So why, uh, why does, if you were presented a computer without a screen, would you be pleased? <laughs> would you feel that was a sufficient gift on its own? No, why does a computer have a screen? It's the interface between the data and the processes and our own consciousness. Yeah, it, it, it's trying to tell us what's going on in that box. Just in relation, notwithstanding the point you made earlier, or showed earlier, about the different colours on the dresses and people interpret them in a different way, some people may interpret them in a different way, uh, and the point then you make prior to that, that is this what we're experiencing? Is it all experienced in the brain? Uh, or is it external and actually is happening? In, in the context of, notwithstanding the point that sometimes you have people get things wrong, etc. But in a general sense, if we all walk out of the street now and we look at the building across the road, we'll see it written that West Bank or whatever. Yes. And, and we'll, we'll have a common, we'll, we'll have a common, common experience. experience. Yes. That's right. And that's very, very important because what we are not presenting is what is termed idealism. Mm -hmm. Idealism is the idea that what you experience in your mind, therefore the only thing that exists is your mind. 
and what you and those ideas in your mind that there may be no reality. We don't say that. We say that there is a reality and that is fed in and is picked up through the senses and it is processed by the brain. You know, that's fine. But by and large we all process at the same time. And we generally process, and actually we're very, very good. Within an, an individual species, we process the same. The interesting thing is that different species process very, very differently and have very different qualia. And that's a fascinating thing. And Thomas Nagel was the uh, philosopher who kind of said, well, what's it actually like to be a bat? I mean, you know, what are they experiencing? Um, we had an experience of this in uh, Buckland, uh, where we've got a colony of bats. And we were out with the Wildlife Trust, and uh, it was dusk, and the bats were starting to come out. We have a thousand lesser horseshoe bats in this roost. Biggest in Europe, actually. Uh, highly protected. And, of course, they chirp at, you know, what we would consider supersonic. You know, it's too high a decibel for us to hear it. So actually, they're speaking to one another and hearing something, and we think there's no sound. So the quality is completely different. The same vibration is entering our ear, but somehow we're not processing it or not doing it. But you can get little gizmos that actually take that and drop it down a few uh, um, octaves, and you go, whoop, 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 whoop. You can hear them kind of <laughs> chirping away. I have one challenge with this argument yeah. here, and I'm sure you can argue, you can answer against it. But you have shown a kind of couple of green lines there. However, it would have been possible using the same equipment and only equipment to actually have shown a screen, sound, and other things. So, isn't your uh, isn't there a kind of counter argument to well, your I, mean, argument I am using here? equipment. Huh? I am using equipment too. Yeah, but, that. but what I'm saying is that screen, instead of showing those green things, which are certainly kind of represent basic impulses going along the optic nerve and everything, but you could have translated that into an image. Yeah, but actually what you've got in the processor here isn't even pretty pictures of the lines. Actually, we don't even have that. Even that is a sort of quality of this. It's to help you understand that actually what's going on there is just electrical, electricity passing, and a lot of zeros and ones. That's actually what you've got in the brain. You haven't even got that. That's just a way of me. But I'm, what I'm saying is, even mechanistically, without any uh, resort to consciousness again, you could have actually made these beeps into something far more intelligible using just a camera and a screen and a speaker and so on. Um, so isn't it therefore possible that actually that process of translating from something which is um, kind of just blips and bleeps into something which is more intelligible, isn't it therefore possible that it is only a me mechanistic process? Well, here's the problem that they have, that within the mechanism of the brain, and all we've been able to find after decades and decades of very advanced research is that we've got the neural patterns. Mm -hmm. And we don't see any system to turn that into something which is projecting on the screen of consciousness. We just cannot get from what's going on there to what it is experienced. And neither are we even able to form a theory of how that works. Um, one of the things we've done in the Apple Paradigm is to look at all the latest, actually, theories from neural coordinate correlates to global workspace theory, integrated information theory, the new theory about uh, the quantum theory and microtubule. None of them have got a theory that anyone else thinks makes any sense or explains qualia. That's the amazing thing. There is not a theory currently existing that explains consciousness, how you go from what's going on in the machinery to the experience that we know we all have. Because why the screen? The screen is trying to communicate 
with something that is not itself. Somehow or other, and we call it the interface in the computing terms. It's something in between the hardware of the machinery, the computing processor, and the person who is experiencing that information in a suitable way. So what we're suggesting is that just in simple terms, and we, we can get into this much more in complicated way, but in simple terms what we're suggesting is that there's four functions in this computing process. There are the sensors, the processor, that's the box that does all the work, an interface which takes the information from that, but presents it in a format that is of use for ex direct experience by the operator. The senses, the brain, and just to give it a very simple European English term, the mind. The mind is a very unspecific term. And ultimately, we've got to do a lot better. We've got to help philosophers go beyond the mind, and we will. And the operator who we term, the Atman. Now, just to kind of explain to you why people think that the brain model is of any value. The brain model we're defining as the idea that all aspects of consciousness can be explained completely by reference to the neurological functions of the brain. Okay? That's the basic premise for physicalist science. That the brain explains everything about consciousness. We just haven't found it yet. Alright? There is some rationale for this. And I'm going to give you the four main arguments why Neuroscience tends to think that maybe we can explain things by the brain. Let's take you through them. One is that the areas within the brain which appear to be the most connected to all the other areas are associated with conscious experience. Now, that's fair enough and that's correct. If you were arranging a computer through this system, where you had sense, sensors, a computer, and you were trying to project to an outside observer, wouldn't it make sense that the parts of this that are, most, that are going to be pulling every information together from all the sensors would be the most connected? So although that is used as an argument for maybe the brains that work, it's the most obvious way in order to create this process within a computer. Subconscious processing. They have done a lot of analysis that there's an awful lot of stuff that's going on within the brain that you are not aware of. Mm -hmm. Now, they say, oh, well, that actually shows that you know, the brains at work and the consciousness is just this little byproduct, which is really just aware of bits and pieces. That's a big, that raises more questions than it's worth, doesn't it? You know? For instance, doesn't the computer know everything that's going on inside the, you know, already? Computer is aware of, well, not aware is the wrong word. The com a computer doesn't make distinction between one little process and another. You know, it doesn't need to separate and only be aware of some little bits of it. But we are only aware of certain things that our brain is doing. But it is exactly like the computer. If you look, turn on your uh, task manager and see all the processes that are going on behind the scenes, especially in the PC, you know, it's absolutely outrageous, isn't it? You know, there's kind of constant pro Are you interested in that? Does it matter to you? But yeah, it does matter that it's going on. But do we care that much? No. What do we want? The gratification. Just show me the conclusion. Give me the picture. Give me the image. Give me the sounds. Just present something nice to me. I don't care what the sub-processing stuff is going on. Just show me the final stuff. That's our attitude towards the brain. We're not interested in all the subconscious stuff. We're only interested in the presentation of a bit of gratification. So that's our advice to the mind. Get us, delve in here, find the stuff that we really like, 
the pretty pictures, the nice sounds, the lovely tastes, you know, decode all that, present all that to us for experience. That is why we as a conscious atma do not experience everything that is going on in the brain. We're not even interested in it. You know? That is why there is a subconscious processing going on behind the scenes that we are not consciously aware of. And this is probably the most uh, usual one. That if you change something within the brain structure, if you change these in things here, some way or other, you're going to change what you experience. Therefore, there must be, they're saying there must be a one-to-one -one relationship. If the brain is damaged, your consciousness is affected. And we say that's absolutely true. Actually, at any stage, if your senses are affected, you're going to have problems. If I knock this off, you're going to have problems, right? And what you experience. In the mind, if the mind is not interpreting it very clearly, you're going to have problems with what is projected. So this does not deny this process. In fact, it helps to es establish it. And it actually helps us to uh, do something that Chita Shakti was talking about. You know, the application of our philosophy to psychology. Actually, we've got something very, very valuable here. And it's something we've been presenting to some kind of academics and things. We say to them, look, even if you're not interested in the idea of a transcendent self, you know, a spiritual atma, this analogy, this analysis and model is very useful because it helps to identify where a disorder may be happening. Is it sensory? Is it just neurological? Is it just a bit of kind of tinkering around within the, the, the brain circuitry? Or is it in how the mind is reading that and presenting it on the screen of consciousness? And how we're receiving it? There becomes various levels of psychology from the Atma through the interface. And even the interface has to be broken down, as we'll see, into a hunkara, buddhi, and mana. And before you get to the brain. And the fourth one is that um, it seems to follow evolution, i.e. creatures which show very low uh, or no conscious <coughs> activity have very little brain power. And the ones with bigger brains seem to have more consciousness. Therefore, it, just, it seems natural that brain and consciousness are the same thing. But actually, if you want conscious experience, it, or let's say, if you want good computing um, experience, you're going to want the biggest and best machine. So maybe it goes the other way. Maybe the species that demands the highest quality qualia and experience require the best processing ability. Whereas if your qualia or experience needs are quite minimal, you can get away with less developed hardware. So, it could be read like that. So, now, those are the reasons, the rationale for the brain model, but there are many issues where the brain model completely is out of sync with the data. And here is some of them. Um, Obviously, here I am as a devotee, you might think, well, yeah, a devotee, he's standing up, he's given us this kind of analysis, and that's typical, devotee's trying to say everything that uh, science says is there in the Bhagavatam, you know. But I didn't get this set of analysis from the Bhagavatam, or from my own speculation. I took it from this. It was an image in a, one of the most important scientific papers on consciousness called a Framework for Consciousness, written by Francis Crick and Christoph Koch. Francis Crick is the DNA guy. After he did his work on DNA, he spent the rest of his life trying to understand consciousness. And his magnus, you know, his opus magnum, you know, his major work was this paper he did. And in that, they did this very simple analysis. That, that's the outside world, 
light enters the eye, it's processed in the brain, and this is going to show you what's going on in the brain. And it's basically, you know, the neurons kind of lining up and forming some kind of digital information within the uh, electrical patterns of the brain. And then somehow or other they did this little arrow producing the image that we are aware of. But the analysis always works like this. That how does this happen? Well, see that bracket. That is what's called the easy bit, or the easy problems. And there we define that we know how to analyze how light goes into the eye. We understand how the eye converts into electricity. We understand where it goes in the brain. We understand you know, how it's flashing away. We can even, you can even get to the point where you can brain read now. You can see certain patterns. Analyze that in the ECG. <laughs> and you can say, ah, he's looking at a cat. No, he's looking at a house. You can get, you can brain read to that degree. But that is not explaining how the brain is producing qualia. They still say, we don't know that process. Nor, who is the eye who sees that imagery? And I just want to show you this statement. No one has produced any plausible explanation as to how the experience of the redness of redness, that's the qualia of, red, of the, the redness that you experience, you know, very poorly there, but the redness of red could arise from the actions of the brain. That is the conclusion. Now do you know where that statement was? On the first page of that scientific paper on the framework of consciousness, written by Francis Crick himself. It's not us saying this, this is them saying this. They have nothing. And here's part of the problems that they know and which are never talked about properly. First one, sparseness. That coming into here, Hitting the retina, 100 billion bits of information are flooding in from the outside world into the, going through the lens to the back of the retina. 100 billion bits of information. By the time it's going down the optic nerve, the amount of information is 6 million. By the time it gets into the processing area, you're down to just 10,000 bits of information. That is the degradation and loss of information quality through that process. What they reckon that is actually utilized by the brain for any individual image is probably about 500 bits of information. That's nothing from the richness that has come through the eye of what 100 billion you're down to 500. Right? So instead of seeing that, at best you'd be seeing sort of blurred. And actually, this is what they say. That there isn't enough information in the brain to be able to produce the experience of a picture that you enjoy at every moment of your life. There just isn't enough information in the brain to do that. Sparseness. Has anyone ever told you about that before? How, how, did, they, how did they work that one out? How did they, were they able to count that? Well, they, just, yeah, they, just, they have some way of analyzing kind of data level. Right. Um, and it just, this is, this is what they kind of worked out. And there's, there's more problems. There's, there's, there's actually there's at least 20 different problems. I'm going to just give you two or three today. One of them is the binding problem. That you've got all the, the sensors are feeding into different parts of the brain. But they actually still don't know how the brain ties that information together. Because the different parts of the brain have got different sensory kind of patterns going on. And how does the brain actually take that together and know how they're meant to fit, fit together? And there is a bigger problem. Uh, yeah, so it, it takes you back to the numbskulls, you know, of your childhood. You know, that all these guys are kind of working completely independently. But that's not how you experience existence. You experience it as it all brought together into a single narrative. And one of the bigger problems is the way these guys work. Now watch this, and watch and listen very carefully. 
Did you hear and see the clap at the same time? Did the two qualities of sound and light reach it? You know, it was part of the single experience, right? The eye and the ear, so the eye department and the ear department actually experience, uh, process their information at different rates. Did you know that? Which one does? Which one is quicker? Light. No, you, that's because you're thinking of the eye. Light moves faster through the through space, right? It moves faster than uh, uh, than uh, sound moves through air. However, the brain processes light slower than it does sound. And do you know what the difference is in processing time? Half a second, according to Brian Cox. And everyone trusts Brian Cox. <laughs> Half a second difference. Now think what this means. You know, and actually, part of the proof of this is for the old Olympic Games. You know that they started races with a fly? But now they use the gun. And the reason is because the brain processes the gun sound quicker than it can produce it process the fly by half a second. So you can shave half a second of a sprint just by starting it with a gun. Right? Now think about this. You didn't experience a time lag. So what is happening? And this is the blue will, this is you know, where the neuroscientists just go completely bonkers. Either you're experiencing existence half a second delay, that the brain is holding back the information, the experience of the uh, sound, waiting for the eye or the part of the brain you know, processing the sight and putting the two together so that you have a single experience. Or, it's done the opposite. It's kind of got the sound sorted and think, oh, well, we better give them some sight to put that with. But it hasn't been processed yet. So you're seeing it half a second before the brain's processed it. Now, both are bonkers, aren't they? They're both bonkers. If you ever experienced playing cricket, a fast foot bowler can, you know, from the time he releases the uh, ball at one end of the... Uh, the wickets down to the other, half a second. That's all it takes. So basically, you'd be standing there thinking, oh, he's just let go of the ball. Why am I hearing the tinkling of my stumps? <laughs> <laughs> you'd be hearing those two sounds at the same You couldn't play, you couldn't interact with the world if there was a delay. Something else is happening. There is advanced reading of that, advanced decoding of that information within the brain through this process that we call the mind, giving you a single narrative. Right? So, either we experience the world with the time delay or the brain feeds this information before it's happened. So, that's just some of the kind of needles, and there are a lot more. We could you know, go on all day, you know, kind of analyzing that what is there in the direct evidence is actually challenging the fact that you can assume that the brain is the all in all. And here's the direct evidence that they have in order to substantiate the brain can produce consciousness. That's it. That's it. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. Now, that's not me speaking as a philosophy, that is that's the fact. Now, there's a big promise that we'll get there, we'll get there, we'll get there, we'll get there. But they started with a big, you know, the brain was a, a very big haystack. And they were looking for this needle of consciousness in it. It was a very big haystack way back 40, 50 years ago. But with the techniques they got now, you know, they're sifting through the straw and the hay very quickly. And they're getting down to the last few kind of things on the ground. And they still haven't found it. So, the brain model approach does four, has four approaches. This is how neuroscience deals with consciousness. And you can remember these four approaches. One, it tries to reduce consciousness to purely mental and psychological processes. Because, you know, we can say, alright, um, this bit of the brain activity seems to be producing um, a thought about such and such. So that's consciousness, isn't it? 
No. <laughs> that's just, that's cool, that's the things we experience. Consciousness isn't the things we experience. Consciousness is the ability to experience those things. Right? Or, and frankly, this is the one that now seems to be getting the most traction. Denying that consciousness exists. It doesn't really exist. The idea that you exist is an illusion. You know, it's just a trick of your brain. It's just something that the brain has done in order to kind of make it more efficient. And particularly more efficient at ensuring uh, that we are interested in the survival of the body. Because ultimately everything depends on survival. And that's all there is. So there is no consciousness, no existence. Or, they, and they, the conscious, they conjure that, well, if there is consciousness, if it is a phenomenon, then it's an epiphenomenon. An epiphenomenon means it is something with emergent properties. That, okay, at a certain point of complexity, something weird happens. And that although consciousness is of a completely different quality to the electrical patterns, this strange property seems to emerge almost by magic. That's what an epiphenomenon is. It's the idea that you get something for nothing. Or you get something without explaining where it came from. It is a completely bogus scientific phrase. Epiphenomenon. So, that's another problem. How they promise that in the future, you know, we'll find it. Those are the only four methods that they have of dealing with consciousness. There is no explanation, there is no proof, there is no evidence. They actually end up having to deny it exists because it is too difficult to deal with. And that's why I, my point to devotees is consciousness is the battleground for preaching. Really, let's get into it. Because this is the weak link of science. The whole scientific process falls on its face when it comes to consciousness. If, you know, they can't explain qualia. It's contradicted by the evidence. It denies our sense of existence, which is, you know, which is our starting point, and offers no direct evidence. And why it matters? Because if it was true, then your existence is an illusion. Then there'd be no free will. No responsibility for anything. No reason, no purpose, no, no ultimate reality to be part of. And even when you talk about compassion and kindness and love, what are these if they're just simply, oh, if this fires like that, you're going to be kind. If it fires the opposite way, you're going to be nasty. So what is, what is love then? What is devotion? What is altruism? What is kindness? These things actually just become washed out. And obviously then there would be no existence beyond the body. So that's where they're going. This is their attempt to destroy any idea that there is any other existence other than this body. That you have to answer to anybody. That you have to even take even responsibility for your own actions. Fortunately, we say there's an alternative. And we're saying we have a paradigm. A philosophical model that fits the scientific evidence, explains the neurological process, and matches our convictions of the self, and can be tested and proved. We actually have direct evidence that this model, that seems to fit this model and not others. Because if we're saying that, okay, there's a physicality of the body with its senses, there is the processing ability of the brain, another physical element, but there is some form of interface that is presenting awareness to you, then you can start to say, well, if you've got a theory, a model, then what evidence might come up that might substantiate that? That the observer can observe stuff that cannot be presented to it by the brain. And one of the ones that's uh, the best ones is done is uh, the study that's been done on brain death by the University of Southampton. They, um, First of all, explain what brain death is. When um, the heart stops, it's not pumping blood to the brain, it starves the brain of oxygen. Within 20 to 30 seconds, the brain stops function. 
flat lines, nothing. Now, on the model that we are just the brain and consciousness is produced by the brain, if there's no activity, if this stops entirely, um, <laughs> I'll press the wrong button, but if that stops entirely, there can be no consciousness. How can there be consciousness if the brain is not doing anything? There's no electrical activity whatsoever. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. It appears that consciousness can continue for at least three minutes after the heart stops, and in some cases longer. This is the study that the University of Southampton did. They um, interviewed 2,000 persons who had been brain dead uh, through A&E, operating table, or somewhere in a hospital. And um, they got to speak to them straight after and asked them what was going on while you were brain dead. 4% said they experienced nothing. Not 100%. 4%. 39 said, well, there was something going on. I knew I was still here, but I didn't really have much idea what was going on. So that was 39%. But they knew they were there. So in that terms, they knew they were still exist. 46 had a broad range of recollection. You know, there was things that they heard, things that they felt, things that you know, they experienced in some way or other about what was going on around them. Nine had the near-death experiences, you know, going down the tunnel to the bright light, which is all explained in the Chattanooga Upanishad, actually. And 2% had out-of-body experiences. Now, the expert on out-of-body experiences in this country is Dr. Penny Sartori, based at the University of Swansea. And uh, I got to do a radio program with her a couple of years back, and she introduced me to um, one of the, uh, the persons who was part of her study. It was a 20-year-old guy who um, was riding his motorbike on the country road, hit um, another car, flew off, smashed. And for a moment he said, there was nothing. Then he thought, I'm okay, I'm alright, yeah, I'm fine. You know, see, you know, don't feel pain, you know, you know, it's all good, no problems. And, but then he kind of thought, but where am I? And he was kind of looking around, oh, he said, oh, there's my bike. Oh, there's my bike's over there by the road. That's great. Well, what's that other thing over there? And there's people running towards it. And they're kind of screaming, you know, somebody's got, you know, they're, they're all kind of bending over to it. And, you know, there seems to be something really going on there. I better go and check it out. Mm -hmm. So he kind of goes up to see what they were up to. And he could hear them talking and the conversations of the medics. And he looks down and says, ah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Not only these very clear out of body experiences. How do you fit that in over just the brain? But these things do fit our paradigm. And there's a lot more of these sort of stuff that we could do. I just want to kind of give a little indication, because we've really got a short time. Um, rather than explore that more, I want to kind of give you an idea that what we are suggesting, and this is the kind of principle is that consciousness isn't just a passive observer. Consciousness drives, influences, affects, manipulates matter. And you have to actually change what you think matter is. I don't think it's something that we understand greatly as devotees. We think matter is hard stuff out there. And we still think consciousness is the ephemeral, wishy-washy stuff. It's the opposite way around. The real stuff is consciousness. Matter is simply information arranged in different ways. Each of the elements of the Panchabhuta you know, and the subtle senses are just information encoded in different forms, revealing different properties. Now, let me just kind of give you a little idea. One of the ways we explain this to those who haven't got a Krishna conscious background is by saying, let's think broader than physical matter. Let's just assume that physical matter is one part of a kind of spectrum, a continuum of energies. And perhaps at one end you've got a conscious field, a part of that energy which exhibits consciousness. And at the other, you've got the part of that spectrum which exhibits physical properties. And those physical properties might be hardness, softness, redness, greenness, you know, sweetness, sourness. 
Those are qualities, properties of, that exhibit within the physical realm. And then somehow or other, there is an interface. And this is very important because part of the reason that the idea that there is a transcendent soul separate from the brain does not, has not had any traction in Europe is because of Descartes. Although, actually, he, he gave a very brilliant analysis of, you know, the meditation separating ourselves from our body, his idea was that there was the brain and the mind and the two things were completely different things. And the obvious question is that's dualism. Not dualism in terms of Vaishnav or Madhavacharya's Mahav, dualism, but dualism in terms that you're now stating there's two types of things, physical matter and an ephemeral mind. So are they, if they're two different things, how do they interact? How can one influence the other? Therefore, it's a stupid idea, it's a stupid philosophy, it doesn't work. And that's not our philosophy. We are not idealism, we are not dualism. What we are suggesting is that there is one energy which exists as a continuum and a different, if you like, frequencies, you know, it seems to that continuum appears to exhibit different properties. At one end, we have it exhibiting consciousness. At the other, physical matter. And there's this interface in between, which is making it a little kind of clearer, which which is connected, it's part of the continuum, and which allows the information to be decoded and presented for the experience of consciousness. Now that's quite a detailed process. If you want to learn more about it, you're going to have to come to the full Atma paradigm course. You know, I can only give you a little bit of analysis today because we're very quickly running out of time. In fact, I'm not even going to give you that. But um, actually, well, I better just do this. Uh, sorry, I'm going to do at least make this statement. Um, this is how neuroscience explains what's, what's going on. Senses give the input into the brain. Somehow or other, those are integrated, and we just heard about all the problems where the brain doesn't, we can't explain how the brain does this, but somehow these inputs are integrated, mixed with memories and also a few new ideas, and turned into a single narrative that is presented on the theatre of consciousness. That's just another way, instead of saying the screen of consciousness, the theatre of consciousness. Theatre of consciousness, again, is a neuroscience term by this guy Bernard Barr, who's responsible for the global workspace theory. So, the big theories about consciousness are using our terminology, using our model, but not actually accept, not actually acknowledging that their model really reveals something, a slightly different conclusion. So, the functions of the interface are to decode the information of the properties of matter, storing it, and processing it for presentation to consciousness. So what we're doing now is just taking the neuroscience idea and actually showing, well, this is what you say is happening. And really, there's, we've turned this into three fields. That there's a sort of proto-physical field, which actually relates to the tan mattress, where the properties that are there in physical matter actually have their subtle qualities existing, sound, sight, taste, etc., in the tan mattress. And that information is then stored in the information field, the akash. The akash is crucial to the process of our experience of the material world. We don't give it anywhere nearly enough credibility or appreciation as uh, an element. You know, we talk about the mind to a blue in the face, you know, and all the problems we have with the mind, but the akash is crucial to how we experience. It is basically the vessel of every single activity that happens within the physical field leaves its imprint in the Akash. And every single activity of our mind, our desires, our plans, leaves its seed in the Akash. What do you mean by the Akash? I'm sorry. Ether, calm. You know, the, um, the fifth element of the... Fifth element. element. Yeah. You, you probably heard Akashic records. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, this is part of... Um, that kind of rationale. And the qualia field is where that information stored within the Akash. And what is the uh, 
uh, element closest to the Akash? Sound. Well, no, that's its, that's its quality. But the element that is closest to Akash Ash. on the subtle side? Ether. No, that is Ether. Akash is Ether. Ash. Ash. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. No? Oh, that's going down the other way. Light. Huh? Mind. Obviously. The mind reads the information. It pulls the information out of the Akash. Uh, 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 just, just to take it that. So these are the kind of different psychic concepts that relate to it. Physical matter, the four hearts, you know, things with agony. The tan mattress, the akash, mana, buddhi, and ahankara, making up what we, we are terming the qualia field. It's all part of this interface. Very important to pull that apart because actually that is utterly brilliant. The brilliance of this description of through Sankhya, it's actually stunning. And it fits all the scientific evidence, and particularly it fits the neurological evidence. <laughs> so, the information field stores, it's actually reality as passive data, it's basically information stored. Some of it waiting to be activated through sound, and then to manifest, through that vibration it manifests the qualities with the tan mattress, and that then affects the manifestation of the properties of the physical world. Then the qualia field is reality as concept. This is information again, but it's information as processed by mana, buddhi, and ahamkara. So this is responsible for the functions related to the processing of qualia and its presentation to us. Three aspects of that. Reading the data stored within the information field, within the cache. Decoding it into image, sensation, thought, emotion, or other mental content. I appear to be rushing, because I'm just really going to go, yeah, I've got to attend the Atma course and thought to get all this. <laughs> Processing, prioritizing, combining all those thoughts into an integrated concept. And presenting the integrated concept as qualia, and awareness, experience, and consciousness. Those are the three functions of the qualia field. And they very clearly relate to the pool of ideas and sensations, mana. The discriminating function, intelligence, buddhi. The theatre of consciousness, the persona, ahankara. Okay? Now, one of the things we have to be clear of is how we get confused by that. And we know it's a question of identification. That the atma is distinct from the ahankara. But we like to enjoy the depictions on the screen or in the theatre. We're like sitting in the, the in the cinema, enjoying something going on, and we get very frightened. We allow ourselves to get frightened. We're sitting there with our popcorn, you know, enjoying ourselves in a perfectly comfortable, perfectly protected, but we are feeling fear. So the experiences of the Atma is purely to do with identification with what is being presented on the theatre of consciousness. But we're not just a recipient of it. Actually, the Atma wants to get out there on the stage. We want to be the leading character on this stage. Yeah? We want the whole drama to revolve around me. And whatever these experiences are, that's me enjoying, you know, and controlling everything. So this is the role, the persona that we adopt. Now, this leads us into looking at consciousness and its relationship to the physical world from the opposite direction. We've really been an analyzing perception as the flow of energy, flow of information from the properties of matter, physical matter, into subtler forms here within the brain, through subtler forms of information ultimately presented onto the most subtle form of information, which is the Ahamkara experience. However, let's think about consciousness as an other role, not just as awareness, but as will. That the expression of will is the principle that conscious intention can be translated into tangible reality. And basically, the Atma seeks experience. Right? So there it goes. It's like you know, these um, virtual reality games, you know? or computer games, where you choose your avatar on the screen, right? You're playing whatever game is, you know, your thing. Alright? 
So we adopt that. And that sets the agenda. Okay? I know this personality. Gratify me. That sets the agenda for Buddhi. So the Buddhi has to set up a little dialogue with the mind. You know? Come up with ideas. Well, you know, what are we going to do? What are you going to enjoy? You know, this guy's demanding gratification. Alright? So the mind is pulling in the ideas, you know, from perhaps some stimulus from the senses. You know, you could be smelling something downstairs. Oh, that smells like food, you know? Or, you know, seeing something. So things are coming in this direction, and there's that kind of process. And ultimately, always a good one for gratification, a bit of food. Works 90% of the time. <laughs> Alright, an idea is forming. Get me a samosa. Alright? Alright? It's approved. The Buddha has accepted that one and thought, okay, let's do it. The big problem, of course, is not every desire can be acted on and fulfilled immediately. Like if you, I've just placed this idea that you would like a samosa, you are not at this moment able to fulfill that desire. But the desire does get encoded and placed in the cache. And it, it stays there as a seed. You have created a desire that at some point will be fulfilled for you. Maybe not as a samosa, maybe yeah. not in this life. But you have created a desire that will be fulfilled. And that then kind of moves on. At some point that can be acted on. And then creates the experience. But what we're going to talk about now is something a little deeper than this expression of will. Not just informing desires which you as a physical person can then fulfill. But actually that consciousness itself has an ability to manipulate matter. And for that we need to understand this aspect that matter is a continuum of information. There's the knower and the known. And the known exists as information. That's what a known is, isn't it? You know, the Vedas describe the knower and the known. Known is information. Right? And that's all there is to it. It's somehow or other, it's a transformation of Kama, of Krishna's energy, into the material energy, but it's basically information encoded in different ways. And for experience, the properties turn into qualities, that stored as event data in the uh, cache, converted then by, into qualia, by the mind, intelligence, and ego, and becomes experience. However, turning it round, let's look at it the other way. Have we got time just to do a little bit of quantum stuff? You okay with that? This is the archetype quantum issue. What's called the double slit experiment. It goes like this. If you have a source of particles or light, photons, in this case we're using light, and it's sending, it's emitting its particles, its things, towards this barrier. Now if there is a single slit in there, then the what will happen when those particles pass through that slit, they will hit this screen, and most of them, the majority of them, will be in the middle. There's a little diffraction, a little spreading out, but basically you get a single band. So, that's fine. That's kind of what you would expect. However, if you have a double slit, the an interesting thing happens. That the light appears, we know it must be passing through here as a wave, and maybe you get wave machines at school in physics or something, because when the light then hits here, and actually is turned, it manifests its particle properties within the scintillation screen, it starts to form these bands. Right? Now where you see these bands, it means that the waves are cancelling or reinforcing each other. So basically this, whenever you see an interference pattern, you know that up to that point, that energy that was coming through there was waves. And it must have come through both slits at the same time. Otherwise it could not have done the interference pattern. When the light passed through a single slit, no interference pattern. When it goes through two, it's able to set up this interference pattern. Therefore it must be waves and it must have gone through both slits simultaneously. Now the interesting thing is 
that if you then decide, well, I want to see what's happening at either one of those slits. Actually, sorry, this one. So, so when the detection is here, when we allow the, uh, the light to hit this screen here, you get the, the patterns. When we want to look at the detection there, and we say, I want to see what light is coming through this particular slit. You know? As soon as you do that, that light which was existing as waves to that point, decides, oh, you're trying to see my particle properties. You're trying to see me directly. You want to see which slit I'm going through. Okay, well, I'm sometimes going through this and sometimes going through this one. And the interference pattern just disappears. Because the light has decided to show a different side of itself. Instead of just continuing on through there as waves, it's now trying to go through there and comply with your interest, your conscious desire to know about its particle properties. You're not doing anything to actually affect the slits. That's the amazing thing. That the properties of matter appear to be dependent upon what properties you wish to investigate within it. That matter has the possibility of being in different places at the same time, of demonstrating its wave kind of nature, or demonstrating its particle thing. But it will choose which one according to what you wish to investigate about it. So this raises the question of whether there is an objective reality outside, or whether the reality of the world is actually dependent upon consciousness and conscious intent. Now, this is still early, you know, it's a hundred years since they did this double slit experiment. Please appreciate this point, that some people think, oh, well, yes, that's quantum theory. Quantum theory is weird. This is not quantum theory. This is quantum experiment. It's not the theory that's saying matter is behaving weirdly. It's the experiment that's telling us that it's behaving weirdly. You know? We're actually trying to find a theory that explains why it's doing that. And that's probably enough. Even if, you, even if you put a detector there, but didn't record it, it would still come through as a wave. It's only when you have the ability to know what it is at that point that it changes. That's part of this weirdness. So what we're suggesting is that consciousness actually does manipulate matter through will, intent, and the information being stored, activated through sound, manifesting in tan matter subtly, and ultimately the properties of um, the physical world. Lots of experiments done on this. The most famous by Princeton Engineering Anonymous Research is Princeton University. They used a random event generator. We were doing this at Jan Nashville using their programs and their uh, equipment. And basically asking experimenters to vary the line up or down, which is an output from a random event generator based on quantum tunneling. So what in fact they're trying to do is get the uh, electron which is coming up against a, quant a barrier to decide to exhibit its quantum state and pass through that barrier, which we'll do randomly, but we're trying to make it go more of them to do that or less of them to do that. We're getting, we're affecting the behavior of subatomic particles and the properties that they exhibit by consciousness. This was their final kind of thing. They said, we tried to get people who tried to do it up, and this is accumulation over 800,000 trials. And those are the ones where they tried to go down. So that's sort of differential. It works out as statistically equal to 1 in 3 billion. The gold standard for any scientific study is 1 in by 4.3 million. If you can prove something to the probability of 1 in 4.3 million, that is the gold standard in science. So 1 in 3 billion is the analysis of this after 800,000 trials. Now, will that be accepted within the scientific community? Of course not. Because are they objective? No. Do they actually care about evidence which challenges their, their own ideas? 
No, it's not like that. Now you can try this at home. This is the rice experiment. We, we, we promoted this at the Jelly It's great fun. You cook a pot of rice and you take equal quantities into two identical containers. One of them you mark full, one of them you mark thanks. Both identical, sterilized, you know, you measured all life. Morning and evening, you take the two of them. First of all, okay, this is the full one. Um, you know, you really give it to it. You know, it's like, you're horrible, you're useless, you're nasty. And it's very hard for devotees to do this because we, you know, this is before it's offered, so we're not criticizing for some, this is before it's offered. <laughs> you know, we've just taken it, doesn't cook. And even then, it's still hard to do. But morning and evening, for a minute, you criticize it heavily. You really give it all your frustrations, every, you know, be as nasty as you can. Don't just say, oh, I think you're a little misunderstood. <laughs> no, that won't work. You've really got to go for it. And then morning and evening for a minute, you take the other one, thanks. You praise it. You know, you're wonderful, nourishing, lovely food, you're a gift of nature, you know, blessing from Krishna. You know, this is just absolutely, you know, I'm so grateful, etc., etc., you know. And then, you know, you do that for a, I could only keep it up for a week because I just couldn't, couldn't criticize the, the rice any longer. But try and do it for a long, you know, two, three, four weeks. And then check it every month or so. Here are the two after nine months. That's the thanks, that's the fool. Already there's a big difference in the disintegration. There it is after 18 months, the fool. Now this nasty brown liquor. This still is holding together as rice. There it is after four years. Still, you would think that surely, it would, you know, if there was a little timeline difference, it would have manifest by no. Four years on, that is still the difference. This is the power of your intention. Consciousness is powerful. Right? We have this uh, sitting in my office. This is the random event generator which does that quantum tunneling thing. I've got it connected to a program which allows me to suggest, like for instance, this one here was done when there was a kirtan at Buckland Hall with some devotees. And I said, I want to take that energy that is going on in that room downstairs during this period, and I want to see how that influences the output of the quantum generator. And that was a deflection. That's a very serious deflection. It's accumulation. It's not just, you know, but basically, you know, it may go up and down a little bit, but really after several hours, it, it evens out. It's like tossing a coin. You might get a heads, heads, heads. But then, you know, the tails, tails, heads, tails, you know, and after hundreds of tosses, it'll be 50-50. Is what you described there, sir, is that the wet experience? I don't know that term, so maybe, maybe tell me about that a bit later, I'm not sure. Science, yeah. um, with the, the one about the water? So, the rice. Rice. I think that could be, it's the guy uh, from Japan. You know, and I think he, he thinks it's good. Yeah, it works. But this, this is, um, so this is interesting. Because, I'm, I'm just going to jump to the, this. This was Wales versus Portugal, a very big event in Wales, you know, during the Europe 70s, you know? Is the semi final of the uh, Euros. Um, that was recorded, the emotions of the Wales supporters at the Millennium Stadium watching it on the big screen on the day, and I recorded that live on the day. Three days later, I asked for the same recording of the Wales fans generally in Wales. And the amazing thing is that it actually followed the same process, same deflection. So you can measure, you can get the effects from group conscious intent and get it to affect physical systems and it has no reference to time it is no reference to place and it's repeatable and um, Princeton University have done this with many events and actually shown like for instance you know this, this is the uh, timing of the matches and I said to someone later, they said, we went to this reading, and they actually showed that there really wasn't any emotion in the Millennium Stadium for most of the first half. He said, yeah, it was absolutely dead, you know. Everyone went out for a drink. 
where there was much more emotion shown um, by the uh, Wales fans generally. Now, this is interesting, and I'm just going to leave you because this is the last couple of minutes on this. This is a principle that we're terming co intentional transformation. If you're asked, do you believe in evolution or do you believe in creation? You say, no, I believe in co intentional transformation. That will stop them in their tracks because we neither believe in evolution nor do we believe in creationism. And I will show you why. If, think about this, that there's a collective group of people and their emotions and their intentions. Without them knowing anything about this, we can gather those emotions together and get it to affect a physical system. And who was able to do that? <laughs> Me! <laughs> you know, the, and who am I? Just another little kind of bewildered Atma. <laughs> if I can take the collective consciousness of all those individuals and get it to, to actually change matter, not just change activities, but actually just take that consciousness directly and affect physical systems. Think about that. The consciousness can be gathered, harvested, interpreted, and used as the template to change how matter manifests. Now, that's exactly what Krishna does. Basically, there is the pradana, the unmanifested material energy. Then, with all the atmas, they produce what is called chitam, contaminated consciousness. That contaminated consciousness is Krishna takes that contaminated consciousness and uses that to convert pradana into mahatattva. And that's the difference between the two. And the mahatattva then is causal because it contains all the desires, all the intentions, all the contaminated conscious of all the atmas due to be manifested in the material world. And that's what starts the whole process rolling. And then when you get into individual universes, Brahma is able to take the collective conscious of all the atmas involved in this universe and say, alright, what sort of universe are we looking for here, you know? You know? What have you got in mind? A place where you can be controllers, you can dominate, you want to hurt people, you want to do this, you want to eat, you, you, what? You really want to cook? So we'll have to come up with a universe that supplies that. And the other devas are involved as well. And they're analyzing your desires and think, well, okay, this is, you know, in order to provide for all your different desires, we're going to have to give you different circumstances. We're going to have different planets, different ecosystems, and a range of species, you know? And basically, Chittam is then divided, you know, and the modes get to work uh, categorizing it all. And Prophet explains, you know, three modes, and then there's three times nine, and three times three is nine, and then nine, you know? And ultimately, this ends up with 8,400,000 different varieties of contaminated consciousness, mm -hmm. which can manifest as all these different species. So, the Davis can take that collective consciousness, of species and allow that to be manifest in certain places at certain times in order for those desires to be fulfilled and that's the constant process that is going on. It is basically collective consciousness producing the reality of the physical world. So, <laughs> what we're suggesting is that, and I think this was important, you know, Jina Shakti mentioned it downstairs, what is that, um, locus of control. This is one of the reasons why people have a hard time with God. Because if you believe in creationism, you're saying that God created the world, and for most people's minds, God creates the world and puts us into it. Right? Or creates us within it. But even as some of his devotees, we kind of give the impression that he puts us into it. So, therefore, you look around and think, well, what's this world like? And of course, there's some beautiful bits of it. Some parts of the world are really nice and beautiful and nice. But there's a lot of nasty stuff and horrible stuff and, you know, misery and suffering and nastiness. And then you say, well, who's responsible for this? God? No. That's not our belief. We cannot blame God for the way this material world is. If we don't like the physical material world that we're in, if we don't like the, species, the type of species we're in, you know, the tour of planet we're in, we've got no one to blame but ourselves. It's a collective co-creation that we set up.
because of our desires. This is simply facilitation. Eco, Bahunum, Yubadati, Kaman. There are innumerable living entities, eternal living entities. But one is maintaining the others and fulfilling their desires. And that's what's happening through this process. So what we're able to do through the, this model, then, you know, is this is taking it up to its theological context, but ratchet it back. We can actually start to analyze why are there different species? How can matter produce different species? What is happening genetically and epigenetically within cells and within organisms? It's very easy to defeat Darwinism, you know, and just poo poo it, you know, that. But we have to be able to give a positive <coughs> explanation of where the species come from. You know? It's very easy to say, well, the universe can't pop out of nothing. But how does the universe manifest? And it's, the key is consciousness. It is the consciousness of the, the Atma, not just individually, but accumulated collectively within this universe and within groups within the universe. So that's what we're trying to kind of explore and develop and present in our Atma Paradigm courses. So come along and join us at the manor in two months' time, 26th, 27th of November. Sign up for this. We're doing some of these mind over matter consciousness experiments. Um, this is what we were kind of doing at Jazz Nashlamin. Another of the uh, aspects of demonstrating consciousness is able to gain information that the brain is not able to is through remote viewing experiments, which we've done a couple of courses on, which has been very nice. And you can join the team. We're looking for individuals who have experience or interest, either in helping in the research or helping to promote in some way or other. But I would hope that um, we can do more to train devotees in some of the simple arguments that can be used in order to help them establish consciousness is not a problem in the brain, we are not these bodies. And from there, take it on. Get them chanting, get them studying Brahmas, but get them to have faith. We want to establish that actually the idea that we are not this body is the rational intellectual viewpoint. Because so everyone knows intuitively that they're not this body. They know there's something more. But they keep telling themselves that can't be right because the scientists are telling us something better. And I don't want to appear stupid, and I don't want to appear that I've just got blind faith, and that I'm just one of these silly kind of sentimental religionists. You know? They're arguing internally with themselves. So we have to equip them that the intelligent viewpoint is the analysis, that consciousness is the primary reality, and that matter takes its drive, takes its message, takes its manifestation from consciousness. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm teasing you with some notes that help you find from the <laughs>